this hearing is slightly a little different as um, the order of things will be slightly different. Uh, we want to, because we are talking about the same subject um, on PFAS, and there's four bills that are very in-depth, uh, we want to have the bill heard at midpoint of this committee, and we want testifier to come first. Uh, and your testimony will be you know, on the subject matter. You can gear to what bill it is, but we want to hear all the testifier first before we hear their bill presentation. So we want to ask that uh, testifier uh, try to stay within the time limit of two minutes, if possible. We'll try to accommodate as much as we can to get your statement on the record. And so, um, any questions so far, members? Okay, good. And we do have quorum now. Uh, the, the bills are in your package, members, uh, in addition to the amendments as well. Three of the four bill, bills has amendments. So let's begin hearing from the testifiers. Um, I will call in this order. I'd like to call Ms. Am Amara Strand, former Tartan High School student. Um, if you're here, please come forward. And once you get up here, uh, feel free to uh, do state your name for the record, even though I re, uh, call your name prior. Uh, do state your name for the record. And uh, whenever you're ready, uh, Ms. Strand. Um, my name is Amara Sturandy. Um, hello, Chair Her and members of the committee. Um, like I said, my name is Amara Strandy, and before I start telling you of the unimaginable, unimaginable trauma I've been living through these last five years, I want to preface my testimony by saying that every word I have said and will say is my own. Yes, uh, can the page go and help her uh, move the mic closer? Yeah. Ms. Strand, you doing you doing well, but yep, yeah, and speak to the mic. <clears throat> In twenty seventeen, at the age of fifteen, I was diagnosed with stage four fibrillomyelitis hepatocellular carcinoma an incredibly rare form of liver cancer that occurs in one in five million people. Due to its rarity and low survival rate, there is no standardized form of systemic treatment other than surgery. There are no curative options, no roadmap, and no plan. Fiber lamellar's unpredictable nature kills in ways too cruel to comprehend. I've had over 20 surgeries, including two liver resections and one open chest surgery. My first tumor weighed in at a hefty 15 pounds, putting me in a coma that lasted over a month. While my body under underwent the horrors of surgery, kidney failure, and having over 75% of my liver removed, my mind went through a series of never-ending nightmares. I experienced PTSD, and I'm haunted by scars on my body that total more than four feet. Now at the age of 20, 2022 was the year my cancer became unstoppable. Last spring, I learned that all four tumors removed in a December 2021 surgery grew back, now worse than ever before. The tumor in the right arm brachial plexus grew back, wrapping around the upper right side of my chest, fracturing my first and third rib, with additional tumors grown next to my heart. The pain in my right hand is, is excruciating, and little can be done to subside it. They can't do surgery this time. There are no more treatments to try. I can no longer move my right arm, hand, and fingers. 
I can no longer braid my hair or play the piano as I once could. My life is a product of toxins. I was exposed to these harmful chemicals through no fault of my own, and as a result, I will die with this cancer. I want to warn you of the realities faced by countless Minnesotans as a direct result of PFAS. I want you to know the story of a community affected by forever chemicals. I am here to advocate for new legislation to protect my community from these toxic chemicals. My story is not unique. I have seen neighbors and friends who have also been affected by these toxic chemicals, and it's time for action. At the beginning of 2020, during my senior year at Tartan High School, four students in my senior class of around 300 had a parent die from cancer. By then, I had learned I wasn't the only student who underwent or was living through a cancer diagnosis. In 2018, an article by the Sydney Morning Herald found that over the, last, over the past 15 years, 21 students at Tartan High School were diagnosed with cancer. At this rate, at least one student at Tartan will be diagnosed with cancer each year. I can easily sympathize with my grieving classmates. Watching a student or a teacher break down in class became common because someone they loved was suffering or had recently died from cancer. As one of those 21 cancer patients, I saw the need and I developed a peer-led cancer support group for my school called Tartan Cancer Alliance. I am stunned that burying a classmate or their loved one was a regular occurrence. As I grew older, I learned it had been the norm in my community for the past 20 years. Don't drink the 3M cancer water was the running joke at my high school. We all knew of the dumb toxic chemicals plaguing our drinking water. We all knew cancer was affecting our community to a disturbing degree. Yet, only recently has there been an attempt to hold billion dollar corporations accountable. We now understand the culprit of our needless suffering to be PFAs. Despite being dangerous to public health, companies knowingly sell consumers' products containing PFAs. These chemicals are used in everyday objects, such as baby toys, cosmetics, cookware, and stain-resistant fabric treatments. Unfortunately, people are subjected to dangerous chemicals unknowingly. It's a repeated offense that has festered our land, water, and bodies for decades. <coughs> I am a witness to this crime, and that has changed the direction of my life and the lives of everyone around me. <coughs> PFAs have created a public health crisis that has plagued my community for nearly 60 years. Corporations like 3M can step up and be the creative leaders we need for us to live PFA-free lives. Whether the bill passes or fall flat, at the end of the day, billion-dollar corporations will still be billion-dollar corporations. How many people will suffer and die so that corporations can avoid the hard work of doing the right thing is what is on the table. My school STEM program often brought in 3M. 3M gave me the impression that they solve what is hard. 3M, the birthplace of forever chemicals, has been solving hard things for decades. We can solve hard things too. Banning PFAs in non-essential items will be hard. A system will need to be developed to determine what items are non-essential and of course, develop a way to hold manufacturers of non-essential items accountable for ending the use of PFAs in their products. We need other resources to replace dangerous PFAs in manufacturing. It only seems natural that we should see a corporation like 3M, who promoted solving what's hard, to rise to the occasion as leaders in innovation. 3M can save lives by rebuilding a community that has built them from the ground up. They have the ability to be a leader among billion dollar corporations. Now is their chance to shine. Chair Her and members of the committee 
please hear my voice and the voices of my community by supporting these bills to stop the dangerous and lethal presence of PFAs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Strangley, for sharing your story and being the forefront of this uh, issue. Um, I know you have your father with you as well. I, I should have called him up with you, but uh, why don't you stay there and have your father come join you at the front? And is, are you coming with another friend as well from uh, Tarnan High School? So why don't you three come yeah. come up and uh, um, then uh, I'd like to call um, Mr. Michael Strandy to to testify. And so Thank please you. state your name for the record. Chair Her and members of the committee, my name is Michael Strandy and I'm the father of Amara Strandy. I would like to state for the record that no one has written any part of my previous testimonies in the House Committee nor in the testimony I'm about to give. My words are my own. It has been brought to my attention that some people who work at the Capitol have questioned what I have presented was written by someone other than myself. It is a very old tactic. If you do not like the message, message discredit the messenger. You most, look, most likely have been informed that PFAS have been, have been classified too broadly. There are some 10,000 substances that fall under the PFAS classification. Perhaps you've been told the legislation passed in other states has created a complex, a, a compliance nightmare for impacted industries. Will it be difficult for corporations and businesses to comply with the bills that are proposed? Yes. It will be difficult at first. It will take time to sort out. I am reminded of the words of President Kennedy when he spoke to the proposed space flight to the moon. He said, quote, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to the other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard, end quote. It is worth the effort to do what is hard if it saves people from having a debilitating disease. It will be hard to unravel the challenges of finding alternative ways to produce products that currently utilize these 10,000 substances. We have done hard things before. It is inevitable that corporations will have to find safe alternatives for PFAS. As of 2020, 23 states are working on legislating the use of PFAS. As recent as January 13th of this year, five countries in Europe, Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden are seeking to legislate rec restrictions or banning the use of PFAS chemicals. Since 2009, the Stockholm Convention have called for the ban of PFAS in 180 countries. The point is that Minnesota will not be alone in the passing of these bills that produce, that protect the people of Minnesota from these forever chemicals. The question is not how businesses will comply to the legislation. The questions you ought to ask is how many lives will be saved by this legislation. The bills proposed are not about how they will affect my daughter, Amara. The banning of re reduction of these forever chemicals are about how they will affect you, your children, your grandchildren. By supporting these bills, you will be giving a billion the billion dollar corporations a clear message. We, the people of Minnesota, place human lives over your ability to make billion dollar profits. Because corporations are more concerned with fighting legislation than regulation, we will ensure regulation by holding you accountable with legislation. How do we know the, they will not self-regulate? One vital piece of evidence. The chemical industries have spent almost $66 million lobbying Congress in 2022 to prevent regulation. Can, we, can you imagine what the chemical industry could do with $66 million if they choose to do what is morally and ethically right? $66 million could have been used to help families struggling with high costs of health care. $66 million could have been used for research for cancer care, curing cancer. 66 million could have been used to find solutions to the PFAS crisis. Please remember what the lobbyists are fighting for. They have been given the task of convincing you that the proposed legislation will affect every sector of the economy. 
Their argument for no legislation is based on a concern for how industries will be challenged. Remember, they represent corporations they are tr that are trying to protect their CEO's million dollar salaries and their billion dollar profits. As a father, who do I represent? I re represent a daughter trying to cope with watching her older sister suffer with a disease that is slowly taking over her body. I represent a wife who lovingly helps her daughter lift her now lifeless arm as she helps her with her winter coat. I represent a young woman of 20 whose classmates and friends stopped inviting her to parties and outings because they couldn't deal with how cancer in their friend makes them uncomfortable. If my family did not have the support of our faith's communities, we would never have been able to keep up with the high cost of health care. My hope and prayer is that we live in a world where young teenage girls do not need a Caring Bridge page or a GoFundMe site to help with the high cost of cancer. Chair Her and members of the committee, I urge you to support these bills that limit or ban the use of PFAS chemicals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strandy. Thank you for being a very strong father and very objective for this uh, subject matter. Um, next testifier, I, I assume, is uh, Jeffrey Munner. Yes, so please, please state your name for the record. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Her and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Munter, and I am here today to emphasize just how important these bills are in preventing the extensive damage I've seen Forever Chemicals can do. Now, I come before you today not as a scientist or as a legal representative, but as an eyewitness to the fallout that you've heard described by my good friend Amara Strandy. From the first day, myself and others at the Tartan High School Theater Department found out one of our own had been diagnosed with cancer, we were scared and we were heartbroken. It was dark to know that someone with so much talent and light in their soul was about to face one of the most cruel diseases a human can endure. It was a lot to comprehend as young adults and I couldn't imagine what it must have been like for her. Time has since passed and I still to this day can't comprehend how so much can be taken away from someone at such a young age. It's not easy visiting someone in the hospital late in the day when they should be at home getting frustrated with their math homework. Um, it's difficult to imagine that the time she should have spent with butterflies in her stomach the week before a performance was replaced with the anxiety of a high-risk surgery. Nothing can prepare you knowing your friend needs to endure things like that constantly. It never gets easier to hear things like, I will die with this cancer, or I don't have a lot of options left. The anger and the exhaustion from this goes beyond anything I can express or even come close to understanding. And this all began before she could start her own life. It's hard to know that this impacts every part of her world, preventing her from having the normal life someone like me often takes for granted. Like most adults, I find myself complaining about my jobs pretty often. Well, I'm not really realizing the value of actually being able to work, am I? I get frustrated getting stuck in traffic, which you're not usually able to experience if you can't even drive. It's not fun to have to tackle an entire day when you're exhausted, so I can't imagine dealing with that all the time on chemo. It's one thing to look from this perspective and think, wow, that is sad, but it's unthinkable to imagine yourself or your family in that position. I know how hard it is for parents to have to see their daughter like this. What if my parents had to watch one of their children try to live with cancer? I know this takes a terrible toll on her sister. What if I had to watch my sister go through this? What if it was one of my cousins? What if it was one of my neighbors? What if it was one of my aunts or uncles? What if it was another one of my friends or anyone who gets needlessly exposed to these risky chemicals? As a lifelong Minnesotan, I feel fortunate to live in a state that prides itself on looking out for one another. I've often referred to it as a statewide community. We're kind enough to open doors for people who we don't even know, and when our neighbors are in need, we help them out. Today, my fellow Minnesota neighbors, I'm here to tell you that these bills are essential to looking out for one another. If the usage of forever chemicals are allowed to continue throughout the state, more of us will have to endure the dark days you've heard Amara describe to you. Her nightmares are not the cost of doing business, but rather the absence of accountability. Although I appreciate promises to move away from these chemicals, I've seen too much to accept breathing room for negligence. 
Businesses will always be essential for the goods and services we need and thrive on, but nowhere in the business model is there the motive to self-regulate. The business model won't be holding to our state values, so it's up to us to hold them accountable. The time to act is now, and these bills will allow us to continue looking out for one another, as Minnesotans do best. I thank you all for your time and hope you consider this when you make your final decision. Thank you, Mr. Monter, for your tes testimony, and thank you, three of you, um, Mr. Monter, Amara, and Mr. Strandry, for your testimony, and uh, you may retreat back to your seat uh, in the audience, and I'll call the next testifier over to the podium here, um, and feel free to stay on uh, during the built presentation in case, in case you have anything to share further. So the next person to I'll be calling to the test testimony is uh, Yvonne uh, Stark. Yvonne Stark from Clean Water Action. Please state your name for the record. Chair Her and members of the committee, I'm Ivana Stark, State Director for Clean Water Action. PFAS impacts us all. Senator McEwen has one type of PFAS identified in drinking water in her district. Senator Eichhorn, who had a $20 million well done because of PFAS contamination, has two types of PFAS in his drinking water. Senator Housechild has one. Senator Hoffman has seven. Senator Kunesh, my senator, we have three. Senator Lang, you have one. Senator Morrison has 11. Senator Wessenberg, you have eight. Senator Green has somehow won the lottery, and uh, none of the drinking water sources that MDH tested had a hit for PFAS, but make no, no mistake, it's, it's coming. And Senator Herr, you've got pig's eye, of course you know that. 98 of 101 closed landfills tested positive for PFAS, 59 landfills with levels considered higher than what the EPA considers safe to drink are located in 41 counties. The EPA is expected to lower what is considered safe levels in drinking water, which is currently at 70 parts per trillion, though many scientists believe no amount is considered safe because of the chemical's ability to bioaccumulate. Bans on the sale of products with PFAS are happening across the country, and we need to take urgent action before we become a dumping ground. Other states are passing bans, and we won run the risk of companies who can no longer sell in states with PFAS regulations dumping products in Minnesota for our families to buy. If we don't move forward with these bills, we run the risk of being inundated with toxins other states won't allow. Don't be bamboozled by large chemical companies who fly in from D.C. and around the country and their allies who declare that they can't do the things that they have shown they can do and have done in other states. Sixteen states are pursuing litigation against the manufacturers of PFAS chemicals for contaminating water supplies and other natural resources. Seventeen state attorney generals have called on the EPA to add PFAS to the chemical of significant concerns list. Class action lawsuits against chemical companies and against product manufacturers who knowingly use PFAS are piling up, and so is the disinformation these companies are trying to spread. In previous legislative testimony in the House Environment and Natural Resource Finance and Policy Committee, the American Chemistry Council claimed that the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, or NASEM, took the position that grouping PFAS together was an inappropriate position to take in public policy. I personally reached out to NASEM for their position, and they did not take that position that was claimed by the American Chemistry Council. We must ban the sale of products with PFAS and non-essential items. We must have the information disclosure, and we must protect our first responders with the fire foam bill. We must reject the proposal of a sell-through date for these dangerous products. We can't financially afford to keep paying to clean up a mess that we are continually adding to, and we can no longer afford the human toll these chemicals are taking. This is an expensive environmental mess that is now a growing public health crisis. Minnesotans value people over profits. I urge your support of these bills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Stark. Um, I'll call uh, Fire Chief of Duluth, uh, Sean Chrisette. Please state your name for the record. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Criget, and I'm the City of Duluth Fire Chief. Thank you for allowing me to testify today on the dangers of AFFF and PFAS firefighting foams and the larger body of chemicals referred to as fluorinated chemicals and their links to increased cancer in firefighters. PFAS, PFOA, and PFOS chemicals may be orally ingested, absorbed through the skin, or inhaled through exposure in the atmosphere. FEMA and the U.S. Fire Administration Protection Against Exposure Suggestions website advise that personnel at all departments that use firefighting AFFFs, PFAS, PFO, and PFOS should practice the following controls uh, to safe exposure um, from these chemicals. Replace older AFFF stocks with fluorine-free foam solutions. Contain and manage AFFF and water runoff. Wear personal protective equipment, PPE, and self-contained breathing apparatus, SCBA, whenever handling AFFF foams. Properly remove and bag contaminated PPE prior to transporting. Use cleaning wipes on your face, neck, and hands immediately after exposure. Clean contaminated PPE and SCBA before its next use, and shower within one hour of returning to the station or home. The Duluth Fire Department has added these measures to our internal policies, but now we need your help to reduce continued exposure to other firefighters and the environment, including the pristine shores of Lake Superior. These are considered forever chemicals that don't break down in the environment. We have contaminated land near the Duluth Airport and the 148th Fighter Wing that continues to threaten groundwater and run off to Lake Superior. Unfortunately, I have attended several funerals this past year of retired Duluth firefighters. One common theme I hear over and over again is that someone else has developed cancer or has recently battled one of the higher risk forms of cancer associated with PFAS foams. This is sad, but it's not a problem that is only affecting retired old firefighters. Today, a Duluth fire captain is battling prostate cancer, one of the several specific types of cancer linked to AFFF and PFAS foam exposure. And we do not know whether he will be able to return to duty or possibly be looking at an even more tragic outcome. You might be wondering how often PFAS foams are still being used in the Minnesota Fire Service today. When a fire department uses a PFAS foam, they are required to report the use to the State Fire Marshal's Division. Data provided to me from the State Fire Marshal's staff reported that 246 fire department response incidents using PFAS foams from June 30th of 2020 through January 29th of 2022. This is a statewide issue with reporting from a landfill in Northern St. Louis County, um, my jurisdiction, to a structure fire in Rochester, to a semi-truck fire in St. Paul, to farm equipment fire in Olivia, to an unintentional release at the airport. This is truly a problem for cities large and small with career and volunteer fire departments out state and metro. Ironically, another source of PFAS chemical exposure to firefighters is the personal protective equipment or PPE that we wear to protect ourselves while fighting a fire. Commonly known as turnout gear, this protective clothing uses PFAS chemicals in manufacturing parts of the moisture barrier and thermal liner. Recent studies have shown increases in blood serum levels of PFOA measured six hours post-dermal exposure, demonstrating that skin is likely a significant route of exposure. The proposed legislation is important as we work through, as we work with turnout gear manufacturers to replace legacy turnout gear manufacturing as new PFAS-free technologies become available. I have talked to several sales representatives who claim that there is still debate as to how dangerous PFAS absorption is as it relates to increased exposure and cancer risk. We're now being told to wear our turnout gear less often for shorter periods of time uh, to try to lessen the exposure to these dangerous toxins. Is that really an answer for firefighters? Wear dangerous gear for less amounts of time? We know, that, we know what we signed up for. We understand the risks that we take to save lives, but being exposed to cancer-causing materials in the gear that is meant to protect us is a risk that we should not have to face. We're asking you to support this legislation restricting the use and manufacturing of these types of fluorinated cancer-causing and environmentally destructive chemicals. Without this legislation, we will continue to hear that we are working on it. Supporting this legislation will ensure action. Thank you, and I'll remain available for questions. Thank Mr. You. Chair. 
just procedural yes. question. Um, yes. Do you, do you want us to save all of our questions for afterwards, or if there's something specific to someone that came up, do you want us to ask it now? How do you want us to do that? I just had a question I thought might be either uh, for the good fire chief or for the head of the fires Asso association later. Do you want us to wait, or how, how do you want to proceed that way, Mr. Chair? Uh, yeah, Senator Senator Icon, let's 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 go ahead with the question okay. now, and if it if it it, it get elongated. Then no, it would we'll, be a pretty quick question. Then, it's then, more of a then, couple then, curiosity then we'll questions that I thought the, the, the chief might be able to help me understand a little better. Sounds good. All right. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chief, for being here. We appreciate your testimony. I just had a couple questions as we're talking about, first of all, the fire foam piece and my city, city of Bemidji, that was mentioned before previously. I don't have Bemidji in my district anymore. Actually, Senator Green has the city of Bemidji now, but they needed a new well because some of the foams were being used for, for training as well over some of the well areas. So we know that's certainly a problem. Don't want to train with those foams anymore. But what I'm wondering, if we, if we ban those foams, take them away, if you're not able to use them at all, does that take a tool out of your tool, tool belt for maybe a larger fire? Uh, specifically in your case, I'd be wondering for like residential or business type structure fires, is this still a tool you need in your tool belt that you use as rare as possible, only in an as needed situation? Is this a tool you still need or is it something that we should go away from? I know there's, there's work being done to find an alternative, but as far as I understand, there isn't really a good alternative quite yet for maybe some of those larger fires. Um, so I'd be curious to, as to your thoughts on that, and then I'll just have one more small question on the clothing piece and your turnout gear. Sure. Uh, Chief Cruze. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, the Duluth Fire Department actually switched over. Uh, we've been totally PFAS free foams uh, since about 2016. Um, on regular structure fires, uh, vehicle fires, uh, tanker fires, uh, we found that the non-fluorinated uh, fire foams that we use are sufficient. I do know that uh, our colleagues in Wisconsin, Superior Wisconsin at the Synovus uh, refinery, they still use both uh, PFAS foams and um, a, non, a, a newer type of foam for a refinery fire. So in a large incident like that, um, the PFAS foams are more effective. So th that is true. Uh, they are still developing uh, better foams. Uh, I guess for, I'll say more uh, everyday use as opposed to that industrial setting, industrial use setting. Um, what we've used uh, in Duluth, we've, we've actually found the new, new types of foams actually very effective. Thank Senator you for that, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the, appreciate the answer. So as we go forward, obviously you guys are, are in a good spot, but it might be something we want to be thoughtful about as we think of like the refinery situations where in very rare instances it may still need to be a tool in the tool belt. So thank you for that answer. I appreciate that. On the turnout gear, um, I'm glad to hear you're able to wear that less. Is there, is there some new technology coming that we're close on that'll provide you know, PPE for you guys that'll be equivalent or are we still years off there? Um, I know there's kind of a little bit of a give and take there, but obviously we want, want your guys to be as safe as possible. So is there anything coming? And what kind of support are you going to need from the state? Because I assume that gear isn't cheap, even remotely. So I assume departments throughout the state will need some help. What kind of help should we be thinking about in the future as we're transitioning? Chief Cruze. Uh Thanks, Mr. Chair, Senator. Um, right now they are developing PFAS-free you know, methods, uh, I know when they've, there's a few companies out there that are trying things, but when they test, uh, when they test it, especially post uh, fire incident, they're still loaded with PFAS chemicals. Uh, and so that technology isn't quite there. How far off are we? I, I really can't answer that. I guess that'd be an industry uh, question. Um, as far as what would we expect to replace turnout gear for all over 20,000 firefighters uh, in Minnesota, the gear that we purchase, is approximately $3,700 per pair. Um, most fire departments have two sets of gear, at least career departments. Uh, so when we have one set of contaminated gear, we have a fresh set uh, to turn to use as we're uh, cleaning, washing, and laundering our, our contaminated gear. So you can extrapolate that out at $3,000 $3, to $4,000 per set times over 20,000 firefighters in Minnesota. Sir? 
Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that additional context. I, I appreciate it. Um, thank you for what you do for your community. And uh, for Mr. Vadness, I know that's coming up in a few minutes. If you can add any additional context to that, that would be greatly appreciated. I won't spend the time asking again, but if when he comes up, if he wants to add anything, that'd be greatly appreciated. That was kind of one of my bigger areas of concern was around firefighting. So I appreciate the, the answers you gave. Thank you. And for you, Mr. Chair, for indulging. No problem. We'll, we'll try to make it flexible and informative as much as we can. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Cruze, and uh, I'll ask uh, for your testimony, and I'll ask uh, uh, Fire Captain Scott uh, Venice to come to the podium here and uh, testify. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Scott Badness. I'm president of the Minnesota Professional Firefighters. I represent over 2,000 firefighter, paramedic, EMT, and dispatchers from all areas of the state. I've been in the fire service for 33 years. I'm a, fourth, a third generation firefighter and a father of a fourth. I'm here today to speak in favor of the firefighting foam ban. At the 2022 IFF Fallen Firefighter Memorial, 75% of the names added to the firewall from, or from occupational cancer. If asked, most Minnesotans would say that the leading cause of death for firefighting is dying in a fire. They're not completely wrong. Fires do not kill us, but fighting fires and all the chemicals associated with it is what kills us. PFAS chemicals are found in a huge number of materials that are used on a day-to-day -day basis, including firefighting equipment. When I started the fire service 33 years ago, we were told that our turnout gear would protect us from firefighting and, and that firefighting foam would help us put out fires. We now know that both are a leading cause of occupational cancer in firefighters. We know that firefighters have a 14% greater chance of dying from cancer than the public. The body of evidence is growing every day. It is anticipated that the World Health Organization uh, very soon will consider uh, firefighting a class one carcinogen with regards to bladder cancer and mesothelioma. More cancers are expected to be added to this list. Exposure to PFAS chemicals through firefighting foam has been related to an increase in bladder and testicular cancer, and there's a strong suggestion that there's an increase in other cancers like breast, prostate, and colorectal. There's also evidence of increase in asthma and autoimmune disease. Studies have shown that one application of AFFF has contaminated surface and groundwater. For example, one researcher said that one single five gallon pail of uh, AFFF uh, will contaminate enough water to fill 400 Olympic sized pools. AFFF is still leading exposure of PFAS chemicals to firefighters, and it is followed closely by our turnout gear and by the byproducts of PFAS firefighting foam is contained, and cont uh, the, I'm sorry, the byproducts of PFAS firefighting foam has contaminated firehouses throughout the state. When they do research on PFAS, they're finding it in our bunk rooms, in our, in our bathrooms, every part of the firehouse they're finding uh, the byproducts of PFAS. The IFF and the Metro Chiefs recently came out with an advisory not to wear a protective turnout gear whenever possible. They're literally saying that unless we're gonna go in and actually fight a structure fire, not to put on the gear that is to protect us. As a result, we have changed several areas in the fire service to better protect ourselves from PFAS chemical exposures. We're trying to change laws where applicable, like this file, Senate file. We limit our exposure to PFAS chemicals during training by not using foam or other chemicals. We are changing equipment designs and how we use that equipment to protect us from PFAS chemicals. We are trying to change the national standards like NFPA 1970-1971 to eliminate PFAS from our turnout gear. We know that the airport industry is awaiting new standards for the federal government to meet the FAA standards. I believe they want to eliminate it as soon as possible. I just came back from a symposium last week specific to firefighter cancers. I learned that Australia is far ahead of us when it's protecting the environment and firefighters. They have stopped using any firefighting foam with PFAS in it, and they're still putting out their fires. They have also decontaminated all of their equipment so it is not PFAS free, so that is being done too. Simply put, I need your help protecting my son, my members, from PFAS chemicals so that they can do the job that every one of us love. 
I've never heard of a PFAS chemical that I want in my blood. If we stop using PFAS tomorrow, it's already a day late. They are man-made chemical synthetic compounds that are forever chemicals and will always be with us. Um, to address uh, the Senator's question in terms of turnout gear, we have a standard that all fire, fire departments use and it's called the National Fire Protection uh, Association. And they set uh, standards in which the way we respond to calls, um, how many people we staff on fire engines, and the kind of equipment that we have in our firehouses. And one of those standards requires that uh, to meet our turnout gear, to meet their standard is to include that PFAS in the layers that the, uh, the chief had mentioned before. Um, we are starting, I'm going to Washington DC uh, this weekend, and uh, we're gonna go out to the Hill and we're trying to pass laws and pressure our federal uh, officials to prevent this from happening. We're also trying to change the laws and um, uh, or the, the rulings at NFPA, and we hope that by January of 2024 that they will change that ruling. It's gonna take time. Um, I'm gonna retire within a couple of years here. I'll never see PFAS-free firefighting gear. And it's been a part of my uh, ensemble my whole life. So um, trying to think what other, the other question you had, I apologize. Senator, Mr. Chair, it was on, on uh, the, the foam, if that completely takes a, a tool in your tool belt away, I'm thinking to be used in very rare circumstances. I'm thinking like the big refinery type fire that was mentioned in a rare case like that. Um, is it still needed? Is there an alternative coming? You probably know better than I do what might be going on federally, where we're at as, as far as an alternative. But until we get there, is there some degree of it maybe still needed in r very rare instances? You know, uh, up until last week when I literally sat down with these uh, Australian firefighters from Victoria, and uh, I thought that, yes, there, there probably needs to, we need to wait until the, the new mill spec comes out so the FAA can uh, to change that standard. Uh, now, uh, they have aircraft uh, accidents down in Australia, they have petroleum fires down in Australia, and they're telling me that the foam that they're using is putting out the fires as good as any of the AFFF foams that they've used. So uh, they've given me some uh, information, and I'll gladly pass that on to this committee. And um, they're also uh, providing me some information on how they um, decontaminate um, all of their firefighting equipment also. Thank you, uh, Captain Vanessa, for your service and also your advocacy and your testimony. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next person um, calling up will be Ann Milhern, uh, Minnesota Youth Collective. And please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Anna Mulhern. I'm going to move the chair forward. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Anna Mulhern, and I am here today to express my support for the proposed legislation, especially Senate File 834, both as a scientist who has researched PFAS and as a representative for young people in Minnesota. My experience as a high school cross-country skier is one example of how we need legislation to protect Minnesotans from toxic PFAS chemicals. Fluorinated ski wax makes skis glide faster over snow and has been used ubiquitously by the cross-country ski community for decades. These waxes also have some of the highest concentration of PFAS of any consumer products. As a high school skier, my teammates and I were regularly exposed to high levels of PFAS as we, under the instruction of our coaches, applied these waxes without using masks or ventilation. Studies have shown elevated PFAS levels in the blood of people who apply these waxes and in trees and snow at ski venues. I voiced concern about PFAS and ski wax to coaches, ski venues, and to the Minnesota State High School League. Despite overwhelming research showing the dangers of PFAS, they waited years to start banning PFAS containing ski wax. While they waited, thousands of high school students, myself included, continued to be exposed to these toxic forever chemicals and the environment was further contaminated with PFAS. This experience of watching leaders ignore the research and put my health, the health of other young people and the environment at risk motivated me to pursue a science degree in college and to research PFAS. 
My goal is to ensure that other young people are not needlessly exposed to toxic forever chemicals for purely non-essential reasons, like being able to ski faster. I wish that Minnesota had had legislation banning non-essential PFAS use before I was in high school, or before I was in middle school, or before I was born. The best time to take action to ban PFAS was decades ago. The second best time is today. Today, you have that chance. You have the chance to take meaningful action to protect yourselves, your families, your communities, our state, and future generations. Don't waste that chance. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Moher. Um, next person uh, to come forward is Andre Lavo. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair Her, <clears throat> members of the committee. My name is Andrea Lovell. I am the Legislative Director at Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Before I came to the Capitol to do environmental policy work, I spent the last decade teaching public speaking classes and coaching high school speech and debate students. The thing I miss the most about that job is watching young people for the first time believe in the power of their own voices. And I want to say that the reason that the students from Tartan's high school testimony is so powerful isn't just because they have cancer. The reason it's compelling is because they believe in their convictions. They know that sharing their perspective with you has power. And from my experience, don't underestimate young people, especially passionate, righteously angry young people. You are going to hear and read a lot of other perspectives from industry today about why this bill isn't, a, or why these bills aren't a good idea for business. They will falsely tell you that alternatives don't exist and that it hasn't been thoroughly studied enough to really know if it's harmful. They're going to tell you that mandates aren't the way, following a period of 60 years where the makers of PFAS knowingly sold dangerous chemicals until there was public pressure and litigation. They will tell you that the public disclosure requirement in this bill will harm proprietary information protection as if trade secrets are more valuable than public health. It is exhausting to have to address these identical arguments from the past time after time with every single toxic chemical we've ever dealt with. It's playbook line for line. In a 2007 article in the American Journal of Public Health, the three ways that the lead industry undermined efforts to ban lead in household substances was the following. First, control research and public information. Second, quote, shape our understanding of lead itself, portraying it as an indispensable and healthful element of essential for all modern life. Lead was portrayed as safe for children to use, to be around and even touch. And the third step, implement exemptions, product by product. The arguments are the same, but PFAS is different. Unlike lead, PFAS is man-made. It is an invented chemical. PFAS does not exist without being created by humans. It does not break down naturally in the environment, and it does not leave our bodies. It also, like lead, causes tremendous life-threatening health consequences, but at levels we can't even detect yet. And thousands of versions of PFAS that we can't even test for because the information isn't publicly disclosed yet. PFAS is used in a much broader variety of consumer products than lead ever was, and yet has no disclosure requirements. Every single person in this room likely has PFAS in their blood that will never leave their body. Not a single strain of PFAS has been proven to be safe. U.S. chemical regulations do not require that a company prove it is safe before selling it. So just because it is on the market does not mean that it is safe. So here we are at the final stage in the playbook where everyone wants an exemption for their product containing PFAS. There are over 50 pages of written testimony telling you that the bill is fine and they'd support it if only you provide an exception for their product. The most amazing thing about these letters requesting exemptions is that this is the only way we are finding out that PFAS is in these products. Here's what I've learned over the last two weeks based on submitted written testimony on what has PFAS in it. 
cleaning products used in schools and hospitals, printer ink and equipment, car seats, strollers, and other child protective equipment, kitchen appliances, shoes, toilet paper, menstrual products, animal products, pharmaceuticals, and dietary supplements. Without a hearing on this bill, we wouldn't even know that these products and these companies are using PFAS because there is no public disclosure requirement. As a consumer, that is outrageous. We buy these products and expose ourselves to toxic chemicals, and then at the end of their product life, they end up in a landfill where the chemical reaches groundwater forever until it once again reaches our bodies. This isn't the first or likely the last toxic chemical that will follow the same storyline of resistance from industry. But I can tell you, it is the biggest and scariest one of our time, and Minnesota is its origin story. Not a single product needs the addition of PFAS. And even if you believe that its waterproofing and oil resistant properties make it desirable, it's not worth the public health and water crisis. It's not worth the cancer clusters in high schools, chronic health conditions, and lives taken too soon because we don't have the political will to do hard things. We know that no other state has gone this far yet, but someone has to be the first. Minnesota was the lead in creating the problem, and so it is our duty to be the lead in solving the problem through bans, public disclosure, and cleanup. And hey, we've been first before. We were the first state to ban toxic TCE just a few years ago. A no vote on this bill doesn't mean a vote in support of business. It means a vote in support of bad business. Don't let the legacy of Minnesota be its legacy chemicals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Laveau. Um, next testifier is uh, Tony Kulas uh, from Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Good afternoon, yep. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Tony Quillis, and I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Chairman, I think the easiest way to do this with the bills is probably break them down into three. And the first one I'd like to start with, um, Mr. Chairman, is the uh, Senate File 222 that deals with juvenile products. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, looking at that bill and comparing it to other states that have enacted laws in this area, there was just some concerns that I talked to Representative or Senator um, May Quaid about uh, the, uh, around the um, definition of intentionally added, um, the de minimis level that's included also in other states that have looked at this further definitions around the uh, direct contact. There is some exemptions down on the bottom of what juvenile products are not, Mr. Chairman, and this would just add other states have um, further defined what direct contact is. And then also what I call the manufacturer retail lag, Mr. Chairman. No matter when you stop the manufacture of a product, there is gonna be product on a truck, in a warehouse, or on a shelf somewhere in the chain of commerce. So Mr. Chairman, I, in a, a very um, generous amount of her time this morning, had a really good meeting with Senator May Quaid. I think you'll see some amendments later on, Mr. Chairman, to address um, some of my concerns uh, along those lines that I just mentioned, and uh, look forward to working with her. We're gonna have a continued conversation about some of the other ones, and so I wanted to give her a special shout out because this morning um, was pretty hectic. She had some bills up, she had some committees, and she made time for me, Mr. Chairman. Um, and so I think that um, um, you're gonna see some amendments later to address some of those concerns, Mr. Chairman. And I really appreciate uh, Senator May Quaid again. I'd really like to thank her for her help on, uh, or listening to my concerns on Senate File 222. Mr. Chairman, in regards to firefighting foam, I started working on this issue in uh, 2019 and we worked with uh, all the stakeholders and came to an agreement that prohibited testing and training of firefighting foam with PFAS. There is no firefighting foam currently used for testing and training and it is supposed to be used for one use only, Mr. Chairman, and that is for emergency situations. 
The current product is effective in putting out liquid fuel fires at airports, refineries, and other facilities, such as what Senator Eichhorn was referencing. When you use water on those type of fires, um, it accelerates the blaze and sometimes actually spreads it. Mr. Chairman, all stakeholders actually have the same goal here. We want to get PFAS out of the firefighting foam. Alternatives are being tested right now, but they have not been approved by the Department of Defense or the FAA. And there's not just one alternative being tested. There's numerous alternatives being tested and evaluated and all kinds of different types of situations and scenarios, such as weather, rain, snow, um, different times of the year, Mr. Chairman. And because these various alternatives are being tested, um, they also have to be tested through types of equipment types of hoses, types of nozzles, and also storage receptacles and make sure that the new product, the new alternative will work and hold in storage receptacles, Mr. Chairman. So we're making progress, we're getting closer, but Mr. Chairman, I think the key, and I've talked to Senator Seberger about this very briefly, and again, she was also very gracious with her time, and I think we share the same goal, Mr. Chairman, but as we're working through this, we want to make sure that there is a certified and accredited alternative. And who does that certification and accreditation? It could be a neutral third party, could be the FAA, it could be the Department of Defense, Mr. Chairman, but just to make sure that there is a certified alternative. Also to make sure that there's adequate timelines once that alternative is certified, they're going to need um, industrial facilities, airports, are going to need time to change out the suppression systems uh, at industrial facilities as well as at airports, and also look at what equipment needs to be possibly switched out. Um, it's still to be determined yet, Mr. Chairman. We haven't decided whether fire trucks would be one example and whether that, those needed to be they can just be flushed or they need to be repurchased. And also make sure there's adequate training time for emergency personnel. And then finally, in that adequate timeline, once there is an alternative, there is going to be supply chain issues because of the demand for this product, Mr. Chairman. So to make sure that there is adequate supply. And then finally, along those lines also, we want to make sure in the definitions that all facilities and all situations are included. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I wanted to thank you for that one would be on um, Senator Seberger's Senate File 776. And again, she was very gracious with her time, and I thank her and look forward to working with her and the firefighters because, again, I think we share the same goal, Mr. Chairman, um, to reach conclusion on that. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, on the last one, um, dealing with um, the, what I call uh, the notification and product prohibition. Senator Gustafson's bill, Senate File 450, is almost um, technically contained in Senate File 834. So, Mr. Chairman, my comments will probably go to both of those. But to talk about um, businesses want to ensure consistency and uniform, uniformity in regulations and prevent a patchwork of reporting requirements and product prohibitions. We talked about, you've heard that there are over 4,000 chemicals in this class. So to make that point, think of a circle with 4,000 lines coming out of it because that's how many chemicals are in this class alone. They all have different properties and characteristics and some of them never come in contact with humans. So when we try and regulate this as a one size fits all, it leads to confusing, confusion and troubling reporting requirements. To the breadth and depth of what Senate File 834 will do, there's an estimated 9 to 12,000 uses, and that's probably on the low end, Mr. Chairman, of this product. And it's in, contained in ATVs, boats, electric vehicles, home appliances, electronics, solar panels, wind turbines, farm implements, airplanes, medical devices, and semiconductors. So businesses, especially small to medium-sized businesses, Mr. Chairman, um, would have to check with their numerous suppliers on something as small as a washer or a gasket because a simple product could contain hundreds of components that will be impacted in this bill. Because there's no de minimis, a simple trace will trigger the reporting requirements that are contained in this bill, Mr. Chairman. 
There's also no data assurance. Um, once that data is all submitted, whether it's proprietary information, trade secrets, or confidential business information, on whether or not that will be protected. When we talk about the definitions, Mr. Chairman, even within Senate File 450 and Senate File 834, the definitions of intentionally added are different, and the intention, even the, the uh, definition of PFAS is different. So that's why we're trying to look for consistency and uniformity uh, as we work through some of these bills and trying to reach resolution, Mr. Chairman. In terms of reporting requirements, everybody points to Maine, and you've heard a little bit about that. There's been over 2,000 exemptions granted starting January 1st of this year, and they've, uh, they've assembled an advisory group to try and clarify the ranges and what their reporting requirements will actually entail. Some of the things that the businesses and the regulatory agencies have run across in Maine include uh, complex supply chains where they go across the globe and trying to trace back certain components is tough to do. Confidentiality agreements where we're again trying to go get companies that are not located in the United States to cough up some of their information, Mr. Chairman, and they have been um, lack to do that. There's Mr. also Mr. the Mr. testing Killa. protocols. Mr. I'm getting I, close, I, Mr. Chairman. The yep. testing protocols. Uh, are uncertain, then once we figure out those testing protocols, uh, the lack of lab capacity. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. You've been generous with your time, um, and I think there will be others also that will comment on that. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the ability to comment today. Thank you, Mr. Kilowas. Um, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit here. Uh, we're going to go to remote testifiers, and by picking up the pace, we're going to really be a little stricter on the two minutes. Uh, uh, presentation. Um, part of it is that those who are on remote are uh, part of business and corporates, and I think they will have the professionalism to keep their time in within that two-minute span. I also want to give time later uh, for those members in the audience that want to uh, freelance and testify as well. So, uh, but we'll get there after the remote testifiers. So I'm going to call on. Um, Ms. Ann Reed, uh, if you can turn on your camera and we'll spot you for the testimony. Uh, once you're on camera, please introduce your name for the record. Good afternoon, Chair Her and committee members. My name is Anna Reed. I am NRDC's lead scientist on PFAS. Um, with uh, scientific partners, I have developed a comprehensive database of over a thousand scientific studies on the health effects linked to PFAS exposure. I also recently co-authored a paper detailing the scientific reasoning for why PFAS should be managed as a class. NRDC supports strong action on all PFAS, which now can constitute a major global environmental and public health threat. This is because they are extremely persistent. Um, they tend to be highly mobile, which means they spread quickly in the environment and their contamination is extremely hard to contain. They can bioaccumulate or build up in plants, animals, and humans, and they have been linked to serious health effects, including cancer, kidney and liver damage, and immune system toxicity. And they are likely to impose massive health care and cleanup costs. The current one chemical at a time approach has not been effective at controlling widespread exposures to PFAS, as other PFAS have been rushed in to replace any banned or regulated PFAS. The magnitude of this problem demands a more efficient and effective approach which is why prominent scientists from around the world are urging a class-based approach for managing PFAS, including the phase-out of all unnecessary uses of PFAS. In addition, the European Chemicals Agency and the state of Maine have already proposed to ban all non-essential uses of PFAS, and more than 10 other states have banned the unnecessary use of PFAS in specific product categories, including textiles, firefighting foam, food packaging, juvenile products, and cosmetics. Earlier this year, I was part of a scientific collaboration that published a paper on this alternative approach to managing hazardous chemicals, known as the essential use approach. It posits that chemicals of concern, like PFAS, should not be used in products or processes where any of the following are true. They're being used for non-essential functions in products, or they're being used in a product that is not critical for the health, safety, or functioning of society, or finally, when there are safer alternatives. Um, to work as intended, the language should be carefully crafted to cover each of these three scenarios, 
And the goal of this approach is not to ban products. It's actually just to continue the use of toxic chemicals when they're not needed. These two policy approaches are what are needed to respond to the magnitude and urgency of this problem. And these approaches will help protect our firefighters, our children, and our communities from these toxic forever chemicals. Uh, we ask for your support, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Uh, thank you for noticing that little ring here. Once you hear that ring, it's time to uh, uh, lead on to your conclusion. So thank you for your tes testimony, Ms. Reed. Uh, next is Linda Bourbon. Um, please, please turn hello, on. Hello. Hello, Turn. can you chair? Yep, we got you. Yes, okay. Um, I'm Linda Birnbaum. I'm a scientist emeritus at the National Institutes of Health. I'm the former director of the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program. <clears throat> and I am currently also a scholar in residence at Duke University. I have been studying PFAS for over 30 years as well as facilitating the study by numerous grantees around the country as well as around the world on the adverse health effects, exposure and health effects to PFAS. As you've heard, PFAS are a huge class of chemicals. According to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, there are over 10,000. According to EPA's Office of Research and Development, there are over 12,000 of these chemicals, and the class keeps growing. The consistent thing about every single one of these is that they are all forever chemicals. The carbon fluorine bond barely occurs in nature. It is extremely resistant to degradation or breakdown, and it does not happen at all in nature. So all PFAS will persist and build up in the environment. Now, many of the PFAS will also persist and build up in us. So that essentially every American today, in fact, most people around the world, most wildlife around the world, including in places we think of pristine as the Arctic, are exposed to increasing concentrations of a variety of PFAS. And while people may say we should just focus on the legacy PFAS, where we have the most data, in fact, when you look at what's in people and in wildlife and in the environment, you find that the legacy are just a small percentage of the totality of the PFAS that are actually in us and our environment. It will never be possible to test all 10,000 or 12,000 of these chemicals, but I should point out that of the number that have been tested, every one has caused adverse health effects in animal species, in mechanistic studies, and many have been associated with adverse effects in people. So I'd like to stress that PFAS are inherently bad because of their persistence, their accumulation, and the plethora of health effects that they can cause. I also want to stress that while PFAS-containing polymers may seem not to cause health effects, you have to make those polymers, and you make them from other PFAS. And in the life cycle of chemicals, such as polymers, the polymers sometimes can break down back to give us precursor molecules. And some of these molecules can further break down in the environment, again, giving us some of the PFAS that have been tested and are problematic. I'd like to enforce the possibility that as we go forward, we focus on the issues of essentiality, which have been used successfully with the Montreal Protocol, where you basically say if you don't really need something, if it's not essential, you stop using it. If it is essential, but there are safe, and I stress safe and tested alternatives, you move to the safe alternatives. And only in the case where something is absolutely essential and you have not found an alternative or a different solution to your problem would you continue to use something. Ms. This approach would Ms. dramatically Ms. decrease the yeah. number of PFAS. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Burbon. Okay, next on remote uh, is uh, Christopher Fenarelli. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Christopher Finarelli with the Household and Commercial Products Association. Uh, today I'm speaking relative to Senate File 834. I uh, refer committee members to our detailed written testimony, except to say the following. Um, HCPA recognizes and appreciates the attention on this important issue. Consumer safety is our top priority. We, we've worked with and support the US EPA's reporting regulations to identify PFAS sources. However, the bill in its current form would decimate entire product categories that not only lack alternatives, but that bring no human exposure during their use. For example, floor maintenance products that extend the life of our floors so we don't have to rip them up and throw them into landfills. The bill captures tools that are important uh, to achieving our climate goals. It captures substances that are not toxic, not bioaccumulative, and not persistent. In other words, substances that act and look nothing like forever chemicals. For example, next generation propellants with glow, glow global warming potential. We, we urge the committee to follow the science when it comes to such far reaching restrictions. We're, we're concerned there hasn't been a sufficient scientific evaluation of the thousands of diverse chemistries this bill seeks to eliminate. Uh, I've shared our concerns with the author as well. We wish to thank the Senator for her willingness to dialogue on this issue. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Fernali. Um, next is Mr. Josh Fisher. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Josh Fisher. I'm here on behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. We're a trade association representing vehicle manufacturers, automated vehicle developers, EV battery producers, and automotive suppliers. I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to share some of our concerns and perspective on Senate File 834, which will raise serious challenges for automakers. Now, there's no question that PFAS are found throughout automobiles. Uh, they play critical durability, flammability, safety, and environmental roles. The PFAS family of chemicals has helped provide this resiliency through the application of coatings and products that resist heat, oil, stains, grease, water, um, all qualities that are imperative for safe vehicle functioning. So just as a general comment, um, because of the complexity of regulating such a broad range of chemicals, we would recommend that any legislation should start by focusing on regulating uh, chemicals that have known health concerns by distinguishing between chemicals that may cause harm and uh, chemicals that do not. Um, a couple of specific issues you know, unique to the auto industry, um, we'd also encourage the remover, removal of the requirement for a full phase out of PFAS, um, as that would most likely uh, result in a complete prohibition of uh, our members' ability to deliver vehicles to the state. Um, automakers and their suppliers do consider the impacts of the chemicals that they use to build today's vehicles, and they take it very seriously and look for you know, lower environmental impact options when they do exist. And to that end, the industry has ceased the use of long-chain PFAS products. Um, despite that, however, there are still some use cases that uh, there's not a uh, reliable uh, alternative chemical. Um, so we would again recommend that if Minnesota is going to move ahead with a phase out, uh, we think it's imperative for the state to have a process and criteria for obtaining a critical or unavoidable use exemption as soon as possible. Um, I'll just uh, meet to what the chamber said about Maine and also note that uh, Gavin Newsom, governor of California, vetoed a, a reporting bill um, based on the cost to the state, but also the, the expectation that U.S. EPA is likely this month to re release their own uh, PFAS reporting rule. And I'll just second, um, again, the chamber's comments about reliable testing methods um, for, for PFAS and products. So appreciate your time. We've submitted more extensive written comments and appreciate the opportunity to provide our perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, next testifier is uh, uh, Rosana Nana uh, Koziki. Please state your name for the record. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Roxy Kazitsky. I'm the Director of State Government Affairs and Regional Affairs at the Advanced Medical Technology Association. Advamed represents nearly 450 of the world's leading innovators of medical devices, diagnostics, and digital health technologies. Advamed is here to testify to express our concerns with Senate File 450 and Senate File 834. Our goal is to work with these, work with the sponsors to ensure that these bills make Minnesota a leading steward of the complex chemicals 
without unreasonably and unnecessarily restricting patient access to essential FDA regulated medical devices and medical products and without duplicating existing rigorous data collection by the FDA. PFAS are a broad class of over 12,000 chemistries providing unsubstitutable attributes of strength, sterility, resilience, and durability required for the safe functioning of medical devices and technology. Unlike many other consumer products, there are no suitable materials that can substitute PFAS in our life-saving and essential FDA-regulated medical devices that can ensure these important properties. However, it is critical to note that the common PFAS used in medical devices known as fluoropolymers are not responsible for the water and soil contamination that is at issue. Advomed believes these bills should focus on non-essential products with the types of PFAS that contribute to the larger share of bioaccumulation and environmental contamination negatively affecting human health. We urge the committee to recognize FDA's unmatched safety standards and approval process for medical devices and technology. The biocompatibility standards and testing required by the FDA considers factors such as neurotoxicity, local and systemic effects, carcinogenic properties, pathological, physiological, reproductive, and developmental effects, among many other factors, before approving a product safe to human health. No other consumer products undergo this level of scrutiny and oversight. Given the complexity, extensive supply chain involvement, and rigorous regulatory framework that goes into the manufacturing and approval of these life-saving technologies, we respectfully request the committee exempt FDA-regulated medical devices and medical products from Senate File 450 and Senate File 834 and adopt the language enclosed in our more detailed written testimonies. Ms. Uh, Ms. the opportunity to provide these comments, and we look forward to working with you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Krasinski. Uh, mm -hmm. Next is uh, Mr. John uh, Kian. Oh, okay. Thank you for being here. Uh, to state your name for the record, Ms. John Kian. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Chair Members of the Committee. Uh, my name is John Kian, the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, also known as AHAM, and we're in opposition to Senate File 834 which would prohibit PFAS, PFAS consumer products. AHIM members produce millions of products each year. They design and build products at the highest levels of quality and safety. Among the issues with this legislation is the broad grouping of PFAS substances, which number in the thousands, with many of them having very different properties, with limited time for compliance with the global supply chain. As discussed earlier, presently, the main Department of Environmental Protection has undertaken tasks for a similar reporting structure and have yet to formalize the reporting requirements. Another, another, another major issue with this bill is the inclusion of HFO refrigerants. HFOs are one of the most climate-friendly alternatives as, as foam-blowing agents as EPA in several states have encouraged and even mandated the transition to these more environmental-friendly alternatives. In other instances, viable alternatives are not even available. Um, finally, last year, EPA issued a notice of proposed rule to require certain entities that manufacture these chemical substances in the year 2011 to report these PFAS uses. We are working to, with the EPA to be a constructive voice in that, those efforts. With that, I strongly urge you to oppose Senate Bill 834 and to avoid a state-by-state -state patchwork. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kian. And now we're going to swing back to remote. Uh, if uh, Mr. Hackman, Andrew Hackman, uh, still online, uh, Go ahead, turn yeah. your camera on and state your name for the record, please. Hi, Chairman Herb. Uh, Andrew Hackman on behalf of the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. Appreciate the opportunity to testify remotely. JPMA is the National Trade Association that represents juvenile products. So that's cribs, that's bassinets, that's strollers, those products that help bring children into life. I'm a father myself of a 14-year-old and a 16-month-old uh, girl. And um, we're an industry that truly does care, uh, and, and safety is our number one priority. Uh, we are not intentionally adding uh, PFAS chemicals, but we do have severely long supply chains. And so we're simply asking uh, here for consistency with the law in California. That's California Assembly Bill 652. I'll echo Mr. Quillis's comments about the amendments and working with the sponsor on those amendments. 
particularly addressing inaccessible components that never come into contact uh, with a child or with anybody that's going to use the product. Uh, the date of manufacture is particularly important. We are dealing with an issue of date of manufacture to get to compliance with the California law, so we're looking to make sure that it's the date of manufacture, particularly as supply chains have been challenged the last several years. Uh, having products on the shelves is something that retailers have done, and working through that inventory is critically important. Uh, and then in terms of speaking to reporting challenges, as some advocates noted, we cannot test for each one of these chemicals. There are about 12,000 chemicals in the state of Maine, as mentioned, and this is more specific to Senate File 834. There have been over 2,000 uh, extensions, as, as mentioned. Some of our members have had to get extensions because there's simply just not the ability to get enough testing capacity to, to validate that your product does not contain a PFAS chemical. So again, our message is we are moving out of these chemicals. We are not intentionally adding them, but we have to go through the supply chain and get enough information to ensure that we're in compliance with the requirement when it comes online in California. And we are seeking to have consistency with the law restricting PFAS and juvenile products that passed in California just a short time ago. So we really appreciate the time and hope that the committee will look to, to merge these bills together as, as they also overlap uh, in the area of, of banning PFAS and juvenile products in both Senate File 634 and Senate File 2222. So appreciate the time and we'll, we'll answer any questions if they come up. Thank you, Mr. Heckman. Next person to testify is Sean Swearingen. This is on remote, so please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Sean Swearingen. I'm the director for the Alliance for Telemark Mystery Stewardship, ATCS. We're a global organization that advocates on behalf of C6 floor telemark based products as part of the American Chemistry Council. On behalf of the members of ATCS, we respectfully oppose uh, Senate Files 450, uh, 776, and 834 as written. Um, the chemical industry supports a comprehensive approach to uh, managing per and polyfluoro alcohol substances that helps ensure the protection of human health and the environment. We have written uh, testimony submitted, but wanted to make a few important points here. As it relates to Senate Files 450 and 834, we certainly agree with the intent and end goal of the measures. PFOA and PFOS are not manufactured in the United States, Europe, or Japan. Um, as written, the definition um, of the substances is too broad and generic to accurately capture uh, the chemistry of concern. Quickly on Maine has been uh, stated elsewhere, uh, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection only recently started their formal, formal rulemaking process, despite the first reporting deadline uh, passing January 1 of this year. Um, as mentioned, they've received 2,000 separate requests for extensions. Um, the sponsor of the initial bill recently stated in a meeting with DEP um, that mistakes were made with the initial bill, and that is why they had an amendment process. Um, also second, uh, the comments on the veto of reporting bill in California, as well as EPA's upcoming Alaska 8A reporting bill launching, and that history goes back 10 years for the chemistry for manufacturers. Um, on the app-specific applications, states like Washington, California, and Colorado have enacted legislation on several of these areas, like carpets, juvenile products, cookware, and cosmetics. The current, the current measures as written um, don't fully take these into account. We believe there's some agreement on alignments that can be made there. Uh, quickly, as it relates to Senate File 776 on AFFF, uh, don't want to repeat too much what's already been said. That is currently the most effective method for extinguishing liquid Class B high hazard fires. Um, they highly recognize that their use is essential in protecting major hazard facilities. Uh, flooring free foam uh, do work on smaller liquid fires, but that um, was recently announced by the Department of Defense. Uh, it does not perform at the needed level for high hazard Class B scenarios. I want to be considered at the time, and for these reasons, we respectfully oppose uh, these three measures 450, 776, 834, as written. Thank you for the consideration and certainly look forward to working with the committee and the bill sponsors on this language. Thank you, Mr. Swearinger. And uh, uh, those who are online, feel free to stay on uh, in case questions are asked that are relevant to um, your agency or your expertise. Um, just want to see if any member in the audience um, want to testify that are not on the list. Okay. So, 
The last person I'll be calling here to, to the testifier table is Mr. Tom Johnson, MPCA. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, uh, the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of the legislature's work, uh, the committee's work to prevent PFAS pollution. As you've heard from many today, uh, PFAS are called forever chemicals because they're exceptionally persistent in the environment. And I want to stress that this is a characteristic shared across the class of chemicals. Um, Continued use of PFAS in industrial and commercial products results in increased loading of these chemicals to the environment and our bodies. As PFAS concentrations increase in the water, fish, soil, and air, the risks of health problems or disruption to our ecosystems will only increase. Preventing the pollution of these persistent chemicals is necessary to protect human health and the environment, and that is MPCA's core mission. Uh, these bills, and in particular, uh, Senate File 834, will help turn off the tap of PFAS flowing into our businesses, homes, waste management facilities, and the environment. Uh, in 2021, Minnesota published its PFAS blueprint. Uh, the PFAS blueprint lays out a path for responding to PFAS contamination in our state. Uh, it outlines a tiered response plan with three steps, uh, with a three-step hierarchy for action, and that's prevent, manage and clean up. Uh, there's very good reason that our highest priority action is preventing PFAS pollution. Preventing these chemicals from entering our homes, businesses, and environment in the first place is by far the most health protective and cost effective path forward. Managing and cleaning, P, uh, cleaning up PFAS pollution is very expensive. When PFAS containing materials end up in waste management facilities like landfills or wastewater treatment plants, Removing the PFAS requires cutting edge, complex technology, and multi-step processes that are often cost prohibitive for the businesses, counties, and municipalities that operate these facilities. Technologies claiming to destroy PFAS are also costly, uh, energy intensive, and often do not fully destroy the chemicals. Cleaning up PFAS contamination in the environment can cost many millions of dollars uh, and take decades to complete. We cannot afford to treat and clean our way out of the PFAS problem. Uh, so in closing, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the MPCA is very pleased to see the committee, uh, as the committee's attention focused on this important issue. Um, there has been attention today on, on the state of Maine. I'll just say that our agency has had many staff-to-staff -staff conversations with the state of Maine and uh, other states, and we stand ready to implement these bills if passed by the committee and the legislature as a whole. Happy to continue to work with the bill authors and other interested members of the committee and in the legislature. And again, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support. Uh, and the MPCA is available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. And thank you to all the testifiers. Uh, now we're going to call the uh, uh, author of the bills, uh, sent the senators uh, to come forth. And we'll go by the order on the list here, Senate File 776, Senator Seberger. If you're ready. And uh, just want folks to know, in case you can't turn around, look at look in the back. As um, the senator has been here throughout our presentation, so all the senators that have their bill presented, they did not just show up for the time where they're scheduled, but they've been here listening to all the tes testimonies. So, Senator uh, Seberger, introduce yourself and um, tell us about your bills. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I am here to present before you Senate File 776, which is a bill to prohibit the use of uh, PFAS in firefighting foam. And um, before I talk too much about the bill, I do have an author's amendment. It's the A3 amendment, which I would offer at this time. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so members, uh, we have an author amendment. Um, is it A3? A3. Uh, all in favor of the author amendment A3 say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Okay, motion prevail. And so uh, Senator Seberger, uh, on to the
the, your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, we've heard a lot about PFAS being the forever chemicals, um, and I found it particularly compelling um, when Ms. Stark talked about all the different kinds of PFAS found in the districts of everyone on this committee. I can represent to you that PFAS is in my well. Um, I am in Afton. We have, uh, we access water from an aquifer that is contaminated by PFAS. The plume, they've been tracking it from the dump site in uh, Woodbury, and it finally made it to my well. We have the enormous filters in my basement uh, filtering out the PFAS, and I'm confident that it's doing the job. But it's there. I live with it. It's in my district from stem to stern, top to bottom. We have PFAS. So my interest is in uh, stopping the introduction of these forever chemicals into our environment, environment. So nobody else has to have the giant uh, filters in their basement that I have. I am also on the fire department. Um, I am keenly aware of the cancer risks that are being discovered every day um, that are faced by firefighters across the state and, and around the world. Um, we know that this profession is uh, dangerous in more ways than one. And now we're discovering that uh, cancer is um, uh, striking all the firefighters and here now with the PFAS in the turnout gear. So um, my bill is to um, eliminate the use of PFAS in firefighting foam. We've heard concerns from uh, the refineries, airports, other folks that, you know, we need the PFAS, we need this foam. So. I would dispute that, however, the parties have been talking, the stakeholders have come to an agreement which is encompassed in my A1 amendment, which provides a little bit of time and breathing room to the refineries and to the airports to um, get possession of the, the, the PFAS alternative that they need um, to, uh, to make their systems as safe as can be. My uh, amendment also does something a little bit further. It looks at the firefighting turnout gear and it um, authorizes uh, a report and some monitoring so that we can know what our firefighters are up against with the PFAS in their turnout gear. The, you know, you've seen it, it's the, it's the firefighter, the big, the big, I call it a snowsuit that you wear in summer, but I mean, it's the big turnout gear, it's the firefighter's uniform um, that they wear every day to every fire, to every car wreck to every uh, motor vehicle accident, to every structure collapse um, around the world. So this is, um, you know, and I will point out, Australia has banned PFAS. Australia has refineries, Australia has airports, Australia has um, big stores of petrochemicals and somehow they have figured it out. They have offered to share with us all of their technology, not only for manufacturing this stuff, but for cleaning out um, existing stuff and existing repositories that contain PFAS. We can do it. You've heard from Scott Vadness, we can do it. The firefighters have no concern that they'd be able to um, effectively extinguish fires. Um, we did it before PFAS. We can do it after PFAS. So I'm, I'm pretty passionate in my, um, my aim here and my goal to prevent further introduction of this noxious substance into our environment so no other families have to be like my family and have these uh, um, systems in their basement um, to filter this toxic stuff out of the water. And you saw the compelling testimony of our young person here battling cancer. Tartan High School is not too far from my district. Okay. There is no reason that there should be kids battling cancer from these chemicals that have been so irresponsibly introduced into our environment. If we can take action today to prevent the introduction of more of this stuff into our environment, we have every obligation to do so. Thank you. Um, I'll, I don't know. Are you taking questions? You want questions? You want the rest of the bills heard? Uh, yes. Uh, any question from members? Okay, looks like we're good. Then uh, um, we're going to motion. As a, as a, this, this bill will be uh, recommend to uh, refer to commerce. So, yes, uh, Senator McCune. Uh, 
Go ahead, make the motion uh, to recommend uh, this. Yeah, go ahead, Senator McEwen. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would motion, make the motion that Senate File 776 is amended, be recommended to pass, and referred to uh, the Commerce Committee. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, opposed nay. Okay, motion prevails. Uh, Senate File now, uh, Senate File. Thank you. 776 is now going to Commerce, and congratulations. Okay, we're going to change the order here. Uh, I'd like to call Senator Morrison uh, on your bill. Senator Morrison, anytime you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 834, a bill to ban the use of PFAS in non-essential products in Minnesota. I first just want to pause and thank the testifiers, um, especially Amara Strandy and her father, Michael, for having the courage to come and share their very personal story and their struggle. Thank you so much. More than seven years ago, members, 200 experts released a consensus statement raising concerns about PFAS and related chemicals. Their concerns about the impact of these so-called forever chemicals, because as we've heard many times today, they don't break down or naturally degrade in nature, were so serious that they recommended that PFAS chemicals should, be, should only be used for essential purposes. The reason for these experts' urgency was the growing body of research that has demonstrated links between PFAS and testicular and kidney cancer, preeclampsia, thyroid disease, ulcerative colitis, high cholesterol, reduced immune response, decreased fertility, low birth weight, and low IQ. These chemicals accumulate in soil, water, and the human body. They've become ubiquitous across the globe as we've poured these chemicals into our environment over the years. And this is not to say that intentional harm was done, but we've learned along the way, and as we learn, we must change our practices. The cleanup of this environmental and public health disaster will be enormous and expensive. We must stop, we must start by stopping these chemicals from entering our environment and our bodies in the first place. So the bill calls for banning non-essential use of intentionally added PFAS in such products as carpets, cleaning products, cookware, cosmetics, children's products, furniture, ski wax, menstrual products, and dental floss beginning January 1st, 2025, followed by a six-year phase-in where MPCA will gather information and ban and exempt products as appropriate, and then beginning on January 1st, 2032, all non-essential products with intentionally added PFAS will be banned in Minnesota, except for products that have intentionally added PFAS that are deemed unavoidable use. 3M has announced its commitment to phase out its use of PFAS chemicals. Bans are being passed and proposed all over the country and the world. There is widespread recognition that we must turn away from this class of chemicals to protect water, land, and human health. Since PFAS started in Minnesota, it's appropriate that we lead in ending its use. Let's act with urgency to stop PFAS and save our water, our money, and our lives. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will stand for questions. Um, yes, uh, Sir, Sir Morrison, you have a A1 amendment. Thank you. Amendment? I do yes. have a DE amendment, Mr. Chair. So A1, all in, yes. All in favor of A1 amendment, say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed, nay. Okay, Thank motion you, prevail. So A1 would put Senate file 834 at, you know, into the shape that the author uh, wants. Um, any questions from members? Uh, Senator McEwen? Oh, or Senator Hoffman. Well, she's first. Okay, all right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Senator Morrison. Um, I actually have a question for um, for our um, from MPCA for the MPCA. If um, Mr. Johnson, yeah, if Mr. Johnson could, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay. 
Um, thank you. So my question, Mr. Chair, is um, around the definition for intentionally added. And I, I just want a little bit of clarification. We heard some testimony earlier about um, different commerce concerns about their own um, economic interests around supply chain. My concern is also related to supply chain. And I'm wondering about a scenario where perhaps a small business makes a child's toy. Um, they are not intentionally adding a material that contains PFAS to that toy. They don't necessarily want it to contain PFAS, but perhaps there's just a material on the market for sale that they purchase on the internet that's manufactured who knows where, and it does contain PFAS. Um, and, and my read of that definition would then exclude that. I'm wondering if you could just educate the committee a little bit about how that situation is going to be addressed um, with, with this bill. Thanks. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator McEwen. I, I would say the, the definition, um, the, the continued presence of PFAS in your example would not be desired in the final product or one of the product's components. Uh, I would also say this bill does a great job at uh, ensuring that the manufacturer is responsible for notifying the seller um, of, of the product. Of, and so that would be part of the process Hopefully, the the manufacturer, the 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 person selling the the children's products would know that there is PFAS in it and would either take actions to uh, remove it or 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 otherwise. So, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that. I I I just am imagining a small business owner in Minnesota making a child's toy and just going online and ordering a bulk whatever that is part of their product. And if that warning isn't put on that product somewhere that they're buying from, who knows where, Taiwan, wherever they're getting this product from, it's just shipped to them and they just include it in there. And as you said, they wouldn't intentionally mean to be adding PFAS. So my concern is that this regulation doesn't apply to that manufacturer. And of course, like, I don't want them you know, punished anyway for inadvertently using PFAS, but we, the whole goal of this legislation is to get this stuff out of our environment, and we certainly don't want it included in um, a child's toy, for example. So um, as we move forward, is there, is there a way that uh, this bill would address that situation to truly phase out even those scenarios where people are perhaps unintentionally um, unknowingly even using materials that contain PFAS in their production. Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, th this scenario is covered within the bill, and I'll just say that it would, it would apply to the manufacturer uh, that the, the retailer is purchasing from online in your scenario. So we're, we're, we're looking to go in this bill, go up the supply chain so the small business in your scenario is not, the onus is not on them, to your point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Johnson, for staying up there. I think a couple of things that, that come to mind just in, in the realm that I live in, carbon fiber is used a lot in AFOs and prosthetics, and I know there's, there's PFAS, PFAS free carbon fiber, but still there seems to be a lot in that, and, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, just having that information in front of us, you know, there's other states that have a single reporting system, and I know um, California, Washington just come to mind on that. Uh, you know, how is the state going to kind of take all this, um, these, these different bills have many facets to it, and I guess the third question then goes to, uh, the good senators here that have these great bills is what's the plan to reconcile these bills or are we going to combine them or how is that going to make it look? Because ultimately in the end, Mr. Johnson, the um, MPCA is going to have to kind of sort out the rules and sort out the pieces on that. And so I just think there's, I know there's going to be a lot of work to do on your end and, and how do you see that going forward uh, would, would be, I guess, an open-ended question. Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I'll, I'll let uh, maybe the authors cover, or, or you, Mr. Chair, how they'll fit together. But in our the the bill itself does have, and I believe this is also in the notification bill, um, 
a, uh, a piece of language where if, if substantially similar information is already available, uh, we would be able to waive the notification requirement. So in, in this case, uh, we often use the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse, which I think you're referring to is where a lot of these states, Washington, Oregon, um, are posting. Uh, Maine is working on their, their process to post these uh, chemicals as well. Um, the states will post that to the database, will share that information, right? So if, there, if that information is already available to us, uh, there will not need to be an, an additional notification. Um, so I think there, there's a, um, an intermarrying there that's already working in the bill. So Mr. Is Chair, that, that was going to be a follow-up question, that Minnesota Statute 116 something 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 that talks about the clearinghouse, that's something that will be utilized efficiently and effectively for this type of conversation, correct? Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That, that's correct. We would be working closely with the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse to build a process by which we can, you know, implement the bill with them. Yeah. So it sounds, Mr. Chair, Sorry, thank you. I love the, the goals that we're talking about and how to achieve that. It's just some methods, methods that need to be worked out, and it sounds like there's still uh, a lot of that's going to be going, and I would assume Senator Morrison, the MPPCA, is going to be taking the lead in all that, talking with the various people, because I want to go back to my first thing. Uh, carbon fiber, uh, when we're talking about uh, mobility for people, especially ankle foot orthotics, AFOs, or prosthetics, carbon fiber is the latest and greatest thing that helps people um, live to their life fullest potential. And, and I know that there is PFAS in some of that, but when it gets baked in, and I don't know what that means for the medical industry, um, I know there are PFAS but they're not PFAS free, but they're not as solidified as the ones that are there. And again, I, I just, it, it, it caused caution because it's a pretty controlled environment anyway. And um, as somebody who spent the last weekend redoing a whole prosthetic, I, I would understand that to, to be true there. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to cut. So um, just, I, I would hope that the MPCA is gonna help give some direction on that as well. Senator Morrison or Senator sure. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator. That's an excellent example of what may be uh, an exemption for if there's not a good alternative um, in a in, for an essential use, an unavoidable use, then that kind of product would be exempted. The point of the bill is to turn off the spigot of PFAS into our environment and to decrease the use as much as is possible. Senator Hoffman, and, and, and just uh, from the standpoint of the omnibus bill, um, it will travel and some, the language will come back to be part of the environmental omnibus bill. Awesome. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the author of the bill, I have just a couple questions. Um, I, I just got the A1 amendment, so I haven't had a chance to go through it. Does, does your A1 amendment address the concerns from the medical uh, standpoint of, of uh, their products? Does it, does it uh, give them, uh, ease their concerns, I guess? Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that question, Senator Green. Uh, I would hope so. You know, it doesn't specify specific products, but it explicitly says that MPCA will evaluate in the same way with um, um, Senator Hoffman's question, if there are medical products for which there's not a good alternative um, to uh, intentional use of PFAS, then that would be an example of a product that would be exempted. Th Senator thank Green. you for that, Mr. Chair. And then the other question is, is along the lines of Senator McEwen's question, because uh, you know it seems to me that in testimony, I remember them saying that the United States and Japan are no longer manufacturing things with PFAS, if I heard that right. But didn't did, didn't mention. It looks like that's wrong. So he's shaking his head. But either way, uh, we have a lot of stuff that's imported from places like. Taiwan and China, a lot of stuff from China. How are we going to regulate that coming in? Are we going to stop the the manufacturing and importing of things like solar panels, for instance, which contain, contain PFAS? And, uh, you know, well, there's just a, a mirage of things that do. So how do you, in this bill, uh, address the, the imports? Sam Morrison, or Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Senator Green, I just wanted to address, I believe the, the testifiers were, were mentioning two uh, specific chemicals, PFOA 
and PFOS. So you, okay. you're right in that those were two specific PFAS that are no longer manufactured, but there are a wealth of other PFAS that are still being manufactured. Um, as far as uh, the the other, I would defer to the author if 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 you have any other answers to the the other piece of that question. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Green, I think that part of the intent of this conversation that we're having really on a global basis, the United States is not the only country that's having this conversation, is uh, for companies to voluntarily, the way 3M has pledged to, to stop using this class of chemical. This is a man-made chemical. It doesn't occur in nature. Um, and so as we, I would think that industry would want to avoid class action lawsuits that it was referenced earlier are starting to pop up. We've got 17 attorney generals suing. We've got all kinds of lawsuits going. As we gather more information, I thought the scientist from NRDC was interesting, the thousand plus scientific articles that she has amassed about the adverse health effects of PFAS. Um, this is this is a um, it's a federal problem and it's a state problem and it's a global problem. Mr. Mr. Chair, one more thing then, uh, and I understand that, but uh, we we have no authority over other nations and what they do, and so the question was along the lines of, of uh, we can stop importing the stuff, but we I don't know how we're going to go to another another country that says no we're not doing this. And so you either have to do it. So that was my question: Do we do we stop the imports then of the of the many millions of items that are brought in? Mr. Johnson. Or oh, yeah. thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I'll I'll just say with with uh, certain online retailers, which I know is is of specific concern, we we've had uh, experience dealing with this in other. Um, uh, product prohibitions that the legislature has passed previously on flame retardants and and uh, and lead, uh, and in those cases we have worked with um, the online retailer uh, themselves, uh, and I won't mention any specific names, but uh, we would work with the state that they were located in in this case, um, and notify the the company the the online retailer themselves that they are in violation by selling to Minnesota these products. And in those cases, they have complied. We have not had any serious concerns with them um, complying with our, 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 our requests that they do not sell those products in Minnesota. Senator Green, you OK, well, thank you. Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess I have you know, concerns, comments, questions. Um, you know, we just heard a bill uh, in energy rate, or I'm sorry, labor right before this. Um, we want to try to increase how energy efficient our buildings are. And we had a testifier say, you know, we have the materials to do this right now to make our buildings more energy efficient. Well, all those energies contain PFAS. So how are we going to both ink be more energy efficient but also decrease our use of PFAS. I guess it would be one question. Maybe that should be something that should be talked about between these bills, because um, all those materials that are going to use to be energy efficient all have PFAS in them. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. I, I, my understanding is that PFAS is a very rare, if at all, in solar panels. Um, but you know what? I believe in our ability to uh, innovate and do research and come up with alternative solutions. We're faced with a big problem here, and we can rise to it. We need to. Yep, I, I guess there's uh, like Senator building Wilson materials. There's talking about metal roofing, asphalt, glass, fabrics. What, it's literally in everything in this building is what I'm talking about is PFAS. So we want going forward this, this energy code adoption modification for commercial buildings. All, new, all commercial buildings have PFAS in all their materials is what I'm talking about. So I'm not talking about just solar panels. It's in everything. So how do we, how do, we do this and that at the same time? We, we can't have both is what I'm trying to get at. Thank you. Um, Mr. So Chair and Senator Wiesenberg, that my bill doesn't address those issues, but there are, are certainly a lot of building materials that do not contain PFAS. Okay. Well, th th thank you. And I do have, um, I guess I have another question. Um, Go ahead, Senator Wissenberg. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. it, maybe it's hypocrisy, um, but, you know, we're, we're talking about being concerned about people's health and ca cancer and these things like 
taking things out of the environment so people aren't getting sick. And at the same time, we're introducing legalizing marijuana, which has carcinogens in its smoke. So, I mean, we've got aldehyde, ammonia, and arsenic, benzene, cadmium, chromium, formaldehyde, hydrogen cyanide, isoprene, let, the list goes on. So we're saying we care about people's health with getting rid of PFAS, but then we're saying let's legalize marijuana, which we know has all this stuff, which could in 20 years lead to an epidemic of lung cancer. So how can you be against PFAS and before marijuana smoke, I guess? It, it, it just seems hip, like hypocrisy to me. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Um, so um, we're going to motion this bill uh, to... Yes, I Senator. I just ask one if I could quick. I didn't realize you were... I thought, Senator Wies I thought she was going to reply to Senator Wiesenberg. But if, if we're... Before yeah. we move on to the bill, may I ask her a question? Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. And, and, Chair. Yeah, Sorry I was behind ahead, the eight ball on that a little bit. Uh, Senator Morrison, it's my understanding that Maine enacted very similar legislation a couple of years ago, and they've had some challenges going through that. And the legislation we have today, again, is very similar to what Maine had done. And from reading through some of the data there, it seems like uh, they've given thousands of uh, exemptions. Have you dove into that at all? Has the uh, PCA dove into that at all so we can learn from their, some of their mistakes so we're not going down the same road, recreating the same wheel, giving the same exemptions? Uh, so maybe it's a question for the PCA more than the author. Can you touch on that a little bit so, again, we're not going down the same rabbit hole they did? Because from, from, from reading I've done, it sounds like they've had quite a few problems with it, and if we're going to do it, we should do it right. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, yes, Senator Eichhorn, to, to your question, we've had many conversations uh, staff to staff with uh, the staff of Maine that are implementing the bill currently in uh, that, or that, that law now in, in Maine. We've also had many staff to staff conversations with even uh, more other large uh, product bans or implementation you know, items with um, uh, Washington and Oregon, which also have large bans of this type, um, not specific uh, to PFAS in the same way, but but in in that same vein. So I, we feel prepared, uh, and and uh, the, we want to thank the author for um, for uh, in the A1 amendment addressing a lot of these items. For example, we've been able to bundle together. Um, products in a, in a way for those exemptions that uh, that Maine did not have in their legislation. So that's just one example of where we would be more efficient in implementing the bill. Um, we also have uh, asked the author, and, and she has agreed to extend those timelines uh, to 2026, and then uh, again in the 2030 ban that was in the underlying bill to 2032, and that ha uh, has given us more time for implementation, which I, which I believe addresses those concerns as well. Uh, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the answer. One more question. I'm still trying to go through the amendment here. I know there's some similarities and some differences. As you are going through doing rulemaking on some of these products, will, the, will there be, like you have in other areas, robust public comment periods for people to be able to give input as you're trying to go through different parts of this legislation? I just wanted to make sure, again, there will be that public comment period. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and yes, Senator, absolutely there will be. It, we would imagine um, there probably being either several rulemakings or, or uh, one very large, robust rulemaking with plenty of opportunities for public comment. Thank you. All right, members, um, we're ready to motion this bill. And uh, Senator Hoffman, would you motion this bill? I still move. All right. <laughs> Sir, Sir Hoffman moved that Senate file 834 as amended to be recommended to be referred to the Commerce Committee. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, opposed nay. Motion prevail. Okay, and then the members, we're going to take as much time as we can. Uh, this room is available up till 530, so we're going to try to uh, hear... The, all the bills that on are on our agenda. Uh, next bill is Senator, uh, Gustafson's, Senator Gustafson's bill, um, Senate File 450. And I noticed uh, the Senator have been, been very attentive on this issue, been here since the very beginning, uh, just so that testify know that we have Senator that are very caring about the, your behalf as well. 
So anytime you're ready, Senator Gustafson, uh, don't, uh, do start by introducing yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members, and thank you for letting me present SF-450. SF-450 takes crucial and practical steps to ensure that there is an accurate list of which products being sold in Minnesota contain PFAS. Um, as the testifier said, the number of products containing PFAS goes well beyond the nonstick pans many of us are familiar with. These chemicals are now in food containers, furniture, makeup, pet products, much more. Quite frankly, the products have become an endemic in the goods that we rely on, something that would shock and outrage many Minnesotan, Minnesota consumers. We are already suffering from the toxic contamination that PFAS have inflicted on our soil, water, and bodies. I find it thoroughly unacceptable that we continue to allow Minnesota consumers to blindly have these products pushed into their lives. Industry says that current chemical forms of PFAS are safer than previous ones, but given the past history of the industry on this topic and the billion dollar costs taxpayers are facing to fix those bad practices, we simply cannot give them the benefit of the doubt. Senate File 450 attempts to bring a minimum balance to this issue by requiring producers to provide the MPCA commissioner a full list of products sold in Minnesota which have intentionally added PFAS. That reporting includes straightforward data the companies uh, should already have readily available, such as what the PFAS does in the product, how much there is, and who the contact person is for the manufacturer. Given the complexity and strictness of standard chemical labeling requirements, these companies should have no problem reporting the simple requirements of SF450. However, the amount of pushback we've already seen about this common sense reporting is alarming and a clear indicator that we cannot trust the PFAS industry to act in the state's best interest. There's absolutely no doubt that our Minnesota communities face significant health consequences from the toxic buildup of PFAS chemicals in our environment. We are just beginning to see the massive human costs these chemicals will be inflicting for some time to come. Minnesotans are, Minnesotans are outraged that this is done to them. They demand accountability. They deserve to be able to make sure their dollars aren't inadvertently going to products that will further this calamity. SF450 takes an important step forward uh, towards ensuring that Minnesota, Minnesota citizens have a say in whether or not we can continue to rely on these products. I urge you to support this bill and empower our citizens. Thank you. Okay, any question from members? Uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll ask my question to Senator Gustafson too because it, 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 is a, it is a valid question. Um, when, we, when we have things that are imported from other countries and there's not really any way to force them to tell us what's in the product, um, will, will manufacturers here be required to do testing on the product to see if PFAS is in it if it's not, uh, if it's not uh, labeled? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Senator Green. The bill, and I believe that Senator Morrison's bill addresses this, so um, I'll stand by the answer that she provided. But this is really to inform consumers. Um, that's what this bill talks about, is just having them know what's in it. For instance, there are toys sitting here, and these are just typical, like, children's toys. We don't know if the PFAS is in them or not, right? And that's sort of the point, is that knowing that just makes an informed consumer. Um, and I think everybody sort of appreciates the fact that they can make that decision for themselves, but at the very bare minimum, we should have that information readily available to us and easily accessible. Yep, well, thank, thank you for the answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But it doesn't really address the question, and I think that if we're going to move forward on this, um, I want to make sure that uh, the manufacturers in our country are protected against things they don't even know about. And, and there again, we're back to do we then ban all products from other countries that aren't complying. So that, you know, it's just an issue that I don't think is being dealt with. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, yep, uh, common well taken. Uh, Senator McEwen, yes. Um, thank you very much for bringing this bill. I definitely um, agree that we all want notice of this. This is just a very basic issue. And I also just want to note that I appreciate the answer that I received to my question earlier um, in regard to um, what this series of bills is doing, and this is a component of that, is to turn off the spigot, 
Right. I mean, that, that makes a heck of a lot of sense. And it also, um, I think, we, we acknowledge that the state of Minnesota has different powers in regard to regulating than the federal government does. And there's, you know, different things that can and should be done in those different jurisdictions. Um, but in as much as we, as the government of the state of Minnesota, can make these decisions to help turn off the spigot and have that ricochet effect, that reverberating effect to reduce these chemicals being put out into our environment, going into our bodies, causing all of this death and destruction. We absolutely should do it. So thank you for bringing this bill. And um, when, when you're ready, Mr. Chair, I I'll make the motion. Okay. Well, I think we're ready. And thank you for, you know, um, explain it uh, so that we, it can, your, your explanation actually answer the question that posed before us. So uh, thank you, uh, Senator Gustin. Any, any uh, remark, any re remark, final remark in, the, in this committee on, on this bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. I would just add that it, it takes legislation like this to sort of create that change in culture that moves people away from toxic chemicals. And, and it's, you know, it's not overnight, and it, uh, it sometimes happens in steps, and sometimes those steps are slower than we would like. But it's good to... It's good to be here. It's good to be moving in the right direction, and hopefully, it'll make a better impact for um, you know our kids, our future. And I appreciate uh, being able to carry this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Senator Kessison and Senator McCune. Will you move this um, Senate File 450 to the Commerce Committee? Refer to com the Commerce Committee. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, so moved. Okay. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed. May mm -hmm. motion prevail. Okay, congratulations. And Senator McQuay, hey, you're there already. <laughs> okay, uh, so, uh, go ahead. Uh, introduce yourself and uh, your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. And I will, I'll be brief because I know we need to get out of here. Yes, and Senator, you have a, an author amendment. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, I actually, I don't want to quite offer that yet. Um, okay. Senator Morrison's bill kind of took care of that, and so I'll just leave mine as is. All right, okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so Senate File 2222, which is just a lovely number for a bill, is a ban on the use of PFAS or forever chemicals in products that are designed and marketed for the use of children under the age of 12. As you all know, I'm a new mom. So two months after I found out I was pregnant with my daughter, I saw an article that cited a study that was done to analyze PFAS and breast milk. 100% of the samples collected showed significant levels of PFAS, nearly 2,000 times what was considered safe drinking and safe in drinking water. During my pregnancy, my wife and I spent months researching car seats and bassinets and strollers so that when we buckled our six, out, six pounds, six ounce nugget into her car seat for the first time, when we laid her in her bassinet for the first time, which turned out to be a very short amount of time, when we took her on her first walk, which was like rookies the first Wednesday of the month during tornado siren testing, uh, we were thought we got the best products. We did so much research. We did not realize that it was legally allowed to put forever chemicals that could hurt our baby in those products. There's so many things my wife and I do to keep our baby safe. Until she could roll over, she was placed on her back. There were no blankets. There were no pillows in her bassinet. She was breastfed. There's no screen time ish. Uh, she eats healthy fruits and vegetables. She only plays with toys that are appropriate for her age. But PFAS never leaves our environment. The furniture that's anchored to her wall, PFAS. And her toys, the hand-me-down toys, the cheap toys, the dollar store toys, PFAS, most likely to have that. She is in the full-on put everything in your mouth phase right now. Everything mouth. My, my pin, actually. My senator pin is most often in her mouth. She loves putting it in her mouth. And even though the toys for children, they are appropriate for her age, they're bright and they make noise and they sing songs and the screws are inset and screwed in tightly, we'll notice that they get loose or if she's picking at them, um, they don't have open batteries. They're all appropriate for her age except harmful chemicals are in them or could be in them. It never occurred to us that we weren't preparing for the right kinds of dangers. We've learned that forever chemicals have devastating consequences for our environment and for our bodies. And so now that we know better, we can do better. And it is especially important for our youngest and most vulnerable Minnesotans, our babies. So this bill gets us the opportunity to stop PFAS and protect the health of all Minnesotans, especially our babies, by banning the use of these harmful chemicals in their items. Any question from members? 
Okay, good. Uh, Sir Haushai, would you motion this, this bill to be referred to uh, uh, Commerce, is it Commerce? Yeah. Commerce <laughs> Committee. Um, thank you, Chair Her and Senator May Quaid. As a fellow uh, young parent myself, I am equally concerned about what you're talking about. So I move that Senate File 2222 be referred to the Commerce Committee. Okay, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Opposed, nay. Okay, motion prevail. Congratulations. All right, so um, we're done with our agendas today, and I uh, want uh, Kara, our community administrator, to to up do you want any other? Okay, all right. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for community and families for your testimony. Um, we're now adjourned of the Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee.